Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous videos, we've been talking about the nephron and the various parts of it. We began by discussing the glomerulus, which is where filtration of the blood occurs. And so we know that blood comes into the glomerular capillaries, and that blood is filtered. And the part of it that actually moves into the tubule system right here is called filtrate. And so that filtrate is going to move through the proximal convoluted tubule, and then eventually it's going to make its way into something called the loop of Henle, which is what we're going to talk about in this video, specifically the descending limb first. But I wanted to remind you that in the proximal convoluted tubule, we have two major processes that are going on. First, we have what's called tubular reabsorption. Tubular reabsorption is where we move substances from the renal tubule, whatever tubule it is, into the blood. And so this is to conserve these things, because remember the glomerulus is not really that selective with what it filters. It's selective based on size. Very large things like large proteins aren't going to be filtered, but all these things right here, they're small enough to where they could easily be filtered. But the glomerulus is not selective. So we don't want to lose too much glucose. We don't want to lose amino acids necessarily and a lot of cations. We want to conserve those. So we're going to reabsorb those from the tubule back into the blood, and that's tubular reabsorption. But then there's also tubular secretion. So these, especially when they're in excess, are waste products. We want to get rid of those. And so tubular secretion is going to move these substances from the blood into the tubule system. Okay? And so as we can see, as you go through the proximal convoluted tubule, the actual composition of that filtrate is going to change, and then eventually it's going to get into the loop of Henle. Okay? Now, the major things you want to associate with the PCT are reabsorption of all these goodies, as I've called them, and then we get a lot of secretion of waste here. The function of the loop of Henle is going to be a little bit different. Okay? So here's the loop of Henle as a whole. We're not going to actually look at this picture first, but I want to orient you with its parts. So up here, this is coming from the proximal convoluted tubule. So the loop of Henle is going to start with a descending limb, sometimes just called the descending loop of Henle, but to be rigorous, we would say the descending limb of the loop of Henle. And it goes down, and some of these loops go farther than others. Some of them remain in the cortex of the, of the kidney. Some of them go all the way down into the medulla. But in any case, it's going to loop around down here, and then it's going to turn into the ascending limb of the loop of Henle and goes back up, and that's going to make its way into what will be the distal convoluted tubule. Okay? Now, as a whole, you need to understand two things. The descending limb of the loop of Henle is responsible for water reabsorption. That's pretty much all it does. Okay? And the ascending limb of the loop of Henle is ion reabsorption. Okay. And one thing I want to point out before we look at the details is that this descending limb is impermeable to ions. Impermeable. So ions cannot actually move from the tubules into the blood here. Okay. This is only for water reabsorption. Whereas for the ascending limb, this is impermeable to water, so only ions can move through here. And of course, they're going to use proteins because, as we'll see, it's active transport, but this is impermeable to water. And so this system where only water moves through the descending limb and ions move through the ascending limb is going to establish an important type of concentration gradient referred to as countercurrent multiplication. So let's first start talking about the ascending loop of Henle. Okay? Even though this actually occurs second, if we're, uh, if we're tracking the flow of filtrate through the limb, it would actually reach the ascending limb last. But this is actually important to start with because the movement of these ions right here, sodium, potassium, and chloride, is actually a prerequisite um, for the water reabsorption. So look at what's happening here. We have reabsorption of these three ions mainly. Okay? So this process is going to require active transport. Okay? So we're going to actively transport sodium, potassium, and chloride from the ascending limb right here of the loop of Henle, first into the interstitial fluid right here, and then into the system of blood vessels called the vasorecta. Okay? So the vasorecta is just going to take these ions and things that are reabsorbed and move them back into the blood supply. Okay? 
So active transport of these things. Now, a lot of times what we'll kind of say, just as a simplification, is that anything that's reabsorbed goes from the tubule into the blood. But really what we need to understand is anything that's reabsorbed doesn't go directly from the tubule to the blood. It actually goes from the tubule initially into this interstitial area and then into the blood. Okay, so it has this intermediate place it has to travel through. So what that means is, is that by pumping these ions into the blood, they're initially all going to be in the interstitial fluid, this interstitial area right here. And so that means that this interstitial area is going to have a really high concentration of ions. And in particular, we really are going to focus on the sodium. Okay? Now what do we know about water reabsorption in the nephron tubules? Water follows salt. And really, we can really simplify that by saying water follows sodium. So when these ions, in particular sodium, are moved initially into this interstitial area, we get this high concentration of ions here. And so there would be a high osmotic pressure. And so there would be a tendency for water to want to follow and come into the interstitial area as well. Okay, so again, you have to have these ions first as a prerequisite being pumped via active transport into the interstitial area. Now they will be moved into the blood, but there is going to be that concentration here that's high in the interstitial area. Okay, so what happens is, is because you have this high concentration here of these ions, particularly sodium, in the interstitial area, you're going to have water that follows, but the water won't actually be moved through the ascending limb because this limb is impermeable to water. Rather, it's the descending limb of the loop of Henle where water is going to move through. Okay, So again, in this interstitial area, you have a high concentration of these ions. Okay, So water is going to move out to follow that salt. Okay, So the second thing to happen is that this water is going to osmose from the descending limb into the interstitial area, and then of course eventually it will go into the blood supply, into the vasa recta, and then will be ultimately moved into the general circulation. Now to make this perfectly clear, let's suppose we had a situation where we completely stopped the pumping of these ions from the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. So the movement stopped. Okay? Well, first of all, we wouldn't have these ions build up in the interstitial fluid, so there would be a very low osmotic pressure here. So if there were no movement of these ions over here in the ascending limb, then that would also cause there to be no water movement in the descending limb of the loop of Henle. Okay? So no ion movement here, no water movement. So again, this ion movement is an important prerequisite. This has to come first before you can actually get the water reabsorption in the descending limb. But in reality, they're all kind of happening at the same time. Okay? But it's useful conceptually to consider this first. All right, so what is the overall function of the loop of Henle? It's really just to get more of these ions reabsorbed and then also the water. Yes, in the proximal convoluted tubule, a lot of these things are important. We've got calcium, glucose, amino acids, bicarbonate. Yeah, those are important. But the body perceives these ions, and water especially, as vital. Very, very important. So that's all the loop of Henle really does. There is one other minor function that we'll look at um, in the next video. But again, get these ions back into the blood. They're vital, and especially water. Now this setup that I just described of all this ion movement and the water reabsorption over here in the descending limb, this setup is something that we term countercurrent multiplication, which seems like a much more complicated issue than it really is. Um, let's actually break it down in different words. So countercurrent, what does that mean? Well, if something has a countercurrent, it means that you have two currents running in opposite directions. So for example, in the descending limb of the loop of Henle, the filtrate which could be considered one current, is moving down. And then the other current, which is in the ascending limb, the filtrate is actually running up. So they're actually running opposite, or they're running anti-parallel to each other. That's a countercurrent. A great example of a real-life countercurrent is a typical street. You have some cars going one direction, other cars going the other. Right? That's a countercurrent. That's exactly what we have here in the loop of Henley. Okay? Now, Let's consider for a moment that we have all these ions being moved out. Okay? We have all these ions being moved out. 
And that's what establishes that osmotic gradient, that osmotic pressure which drives the water reabsorption in the descending limb. So let's track the movement of the filtrate through the limbs. Okay, so filtrate would enter here through the proximal convoluted tubule. And notice over here I've got these numbers. These are actually osmolarities. Osmolarity is a measure of the concentration of the filtrate. Okay, so as the filtrate's moving through here, water is going to be reabsorbed, right? So as we go through here, more and more water is being reabsorbed. If I look at the filtrate as it goes down the descending limb, more and more water is going to be reabsorbed. Now, if you reabsorb water, then what's going to happen to the osmolarity, which is a concentration? It's going to go up. So notice as we go down the descending limb, the osmolarity or concentration of the filtrate goes from 300 as up to as much as 1200. And that's because you're reabsorbing water. This is a concentration of the solutes. That is things like sodium, potassium, and chloride. And so as you're going down, if you're reabsorbing water, as you go down more and more, more and more water is being reabsorbed. Okay? And so the osmolarity is increasing until you actually get down to the base of, the, of this loop of Henle, the actual loop part, and you have the osmolarity maximized at, let's say, 1200. Okay? So at this point, you've concentrated the filtrate here going down to the loop. But now as you go back up, notice that you're actually reabsorbing those ions. Okay? So you have an osmolarity of 1200 here at the base, but as you go up, you're reabsorbing ions. And so you're going from an osmolarity of 1200 to 1000 to 800 to 600 and so on and so forth. So as you go up the ascending limb, you're pumping ions out more and more. And so then the concentration of those ions is going down from 1200 down to as much as 300. This setup would never work if both limbs were running in the same direction, or in other words, they were parallel. They have to be anti-parallel. They have to be running in opposite directions. And so in the descending limb, you're moving that water out, and so the osmolarity is increasing. But then, as you move up the ascending limb, you're pumping these ions out, and the osmolarity goes back down to 300. And what a system like this is, is countercurrent multiplication, and what it serves to do is give you amplified reabsorption of both the water and the ions. Okay? So this is countercurrent multiplication. So hopefully this made sense to you. In the next video, we're actually going to continue with the loop of Henle and do something called urea recycling. And what we're going to see is that urea actually is going to play a role in adding to this osmotic gradient and driving even more water reabsorption. Okay? The most important thing of the loop of Henle, other than these ions, is to get that water reabsorbed. Water volume in the blood is extremely important. And so we can actually get more water reabsorption by this process called urea recycling. We're going to talk about that in the next video. So hopefully this made sense. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.